We're going crazy! Yeah! Free maps aesthetic. Here's all you got. We're crazy for giving away so much free stuff. And we do it every single damn time because we're the best fitness podcast in the world. All right, here's what you got to do to get that free program. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours underneath this video and make it a good comment. Make it interesting. Talk with your friends. Have a debate. I don't know. Do something cool. If we pick your comment, you'll get free access to Maps Aesthetic. You also got to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. One more thing before we start the podcast. And by the way, you're going to love this podcast. It's freaking hot. It's an awesome podcast. One more thing. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle. All three of those, 50% off. That's insane. Go check them out. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just make, make sure you use the code June Prime for the discount. All right, enjoy the podcast. Mark Randolph, right? Founder of Netflix. We interviewed him. Oh, yeah. What a great interview, right? Oh, good time. Yeah, it was smart guy. Yeah, oh. it was a fun one. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm really excited. So the audience knows that we just released this. So I, I, I believe the last four interviews that we have done are the, the four best interviews Mind Pump has recorded yet. Probably. In my opinion. I would agree. I could, yeah. I can and get down with that. Tonal was the first one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, five, actually. Five, four or five, Doug. What we got? I think probably five. Yeah, actually. so the last the last five I thought were the bed. Tonal's the first one of the mm -hmm. five that we're, we've released. Um, Mark Randolph will be another one uh, that's coming out that I thought was just a really fun conversation. But since then, I bought his book. I've been and I've listened to damn near almost all his episodes on his podcast. If you are a uh, aspiring entrepreneur or you're trying to build a business uh, in any in any capacity. Uh, the value of his podcast is unbelievable. I mean, it's it, you know what he does cuts all the fat out, but also you know what he does. He communicates what's effective in an easy to understand, yeah, effective way. He, um, I, I mean, think sometimes people communicate what he's saying, but they do it in a way that's not. It's hard to apply or understand. He he completely kind of shattered my paradigm as far as the way I looked at like idea. I like I wish that. I had found his content before I probably tried eight different businesses yeah. before. Yeah. Because what one of the number one things that I see people make as far as mistakes when trying to start a business is overcomplicating testing their theory. Mm -hmm. So you're you have an idea, whether it be this app that's gonna, you know, provide this for people or this this shirt line or yeah, whatever. this marketplace that's gonna connect these two different So your first iteration costs tens of thousands that's of right. dollars. That's right. Or it takes you months or years to build and you need partners and you need possibly money. When all you need to do is swing the bat just to see yeah, how to he, adjust. And he right? does this and, and he gets these so his whole mm -hmm. podcast, he does not interview big people at all. He av he interviews average people. And is he, is he coaching them? Yeah. yeah that's that's all, the, 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 it's a literally like a 30, 40 minute that's so effective. coaching session. And he gets entrepreneurs that are like at, in inception, like mm -hmm. they just have the idea and they're getting ready to put it into play. He gets people that are, you know, midway through funding. Get, I mean, you get all this, this, this array of like levels of entrepreneurship. And the, the one theme that the common theme that I keep hearing from him is this you know, trying to get people to look at applying their ideas or testing their hypothesis without having to build the final product or go into all this debt to try and show they have this brilliant idea. And like, I just think it's- That's probably the biggest roadblock. Yeah. Is that people That's have an idea- companies. And they think in order to start testing their idea, it's too expensive, takes too much time. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. When reality, you can find a way to test it in a very inexpensive way. And it's smarter to do that anyway, because you never know. Well, well that's the trend here in Silicon Valley, yes. especially because it's everybody was so basing their ideas on, can I get funding for this? Yeah. And, and so it became like all these incubators and all these things popped up to try and like prop up that idea. And it was like a, a common thing, but a lot of these, these companies like don't exist now. Well, either that or just the idea that, the, that an app is the answer. Yeah, like so many, what, especially here, like where we're at in the Silicon Valley, like it, it is app land. You know, everybody wants to build. Everyone has this next great app idea. Do you guys know what the fail rate is with yeah. apps? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but I know it's, it's like through it's, the roof. Right? Yeah, it's eighty or ninety something percent. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's yeah. extremely high as far as the fail. And then not only that, it's super but, expensive. To um, produce. The most successful apps are like free tools. Mm -hmm. So the ones and the ones that make the most money are games. So if you have this concept of an, an app that you think is just going to change change how people do business, uh, you should. I mean, it changed. I mean, Justin and I, when we first originally were building our app, 
I remember like we pivoted halfway through because we found we found that out as we were in the middle of trying to build this this like avatar building. That for- has to be, by the way, the most guaranteed thing that'll happen to you when you start a business is you're going to have to pivot and mm-hmm. change. Yeah, he says it in his podcast. Like, never does the uh, I forget how he, he he says it never looks at the end. The well, yeah, way yeah, you yeah. It yeah the adult version never looks like the the infant. You know, mm-hmm. like it, it grows to be something completely different. That's just that's yeah. how business works. So, so, so try and mitigate you know the amount of income that you're putting towards that. Like in the beginning stages, especially. Well, it even makes me go back. Okay, so let's use a, us for an example, Justin, because this obviously it stings for me because of how much money I lost trying to build the app, right? right. Um, you know, and so Justin and I were building this app that was going to gamify fitness. I actually, I think it was a, I still think it's a, a somewhat of a brilliant idea. And, uh, we put a lot of effort into it and we started to build it out and, and spent a lot of money with the engineers. But what we should have done was drawn it all on paper and try to gather people yeah. and take them through it manually right. until we are just overwhelmed with, Oh my God, everybody wants to do this. People are giving us money to take them through this. Yeah physical game yep. of fitness mm-hmm. in person and then he goes and then when you do that now you have real real tangible uh, metrics that you can take to investors and say look it i have this idea for i've already it. got the demand yeah, yeah i've had it an works. I, i've had an idea for this app or whatever like that yeah it's proof of concept i've showed yeah i've showed proof of concept in this i'm overwhelmed i'm my buddy my partner and i have got people banging down our door they want us to take us through this video game version of fitness that we've came up with Mm-hmm. And they love it. Here's all the the reviews yeah. from the, and then now let's go try and spend seventy thousand, a hundred thousand dollars on an app that we and prove that they're. And I just don't know. I mean, I'm so mad at myself for not. Yeah, think- you can't though, dude. I mean, you learned. Uh, you learned yeah, by trying. And part of the education, unfortunately. Yeah, and when you hear Mark Randolph, who's started and sold companies and been just extremely successful. What you're hearing is the black belt version of Mark, and I'm sure if you talk to him when he first started, he might not have been able to communicate. <clears throat> right, this. right. So it's it's hard to beat yourself up, self up over something that you couldn't. Have yeah, but I, I mean, it, to me, it, but it, it is great that there's that resource now. And uh, yeah, and it's such a, a simple concept when you actually think about it's it. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. It is. It's a. It's such a. I mean, can you take? So if you're listening right now wa- or watching the show, and you're an entrepreneur and you think you have this brilliant idea, can you distill it down to its simplest form? And manually go do it and uh, and test your hypothesis until you are up at two o'clock in the morning because you're you're just overwhelmed with right. clientele like and the demand just screams like it, that's it right. Needs funding. Yeah. And he says what's beautiful about that is is uh, along the way uh, that in that process you learn so many other things. Like you know if we were to do, take our app for example with the games, we think this level's perfect here than there. Well, we were taking people manually through it. They'll like, tell oh, us. Oh, yeah. shit. That was too hard. Instead of making right. the app, right. spending $100,000 on yeah. it, and then and being then, like, oh, this doesn't work. Then trying to get yeah the audience and the community to, to get behind That's it. That's right. You're, yeah, you're creating it I simultaneously. Know. So cool. I know. You yeah. know, talking about him and successful people uh, reminds me of just this, uh, boy, have I been getting going back and forth with people on the internet with, have you guys seen that report that came out about Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk? Not paying taxes. Not paying income taxes. I love that. And people are like, oh my God. Losing their mind yeah. over that, huh? So I'm going back and forth with people. And I love it because, I don't love it. Actually, I do. I love debating and discussing things. But people are, and this is not, I'm not trying to be offensive. People are completely ignorant to, first off, how taxes work. But also to the value that certain people bring to society. They ignore that. So let's talk about taxes for a second, right? Let's talk about Jeff Bezos. He might have paid no income taxes. And that, by the way, is because he probably made no income. His right. wealth- He wasn't taking income. In. Right. His wealth is reflected in his probably shares, which he hasn't realized. I mean, he hasn't sold them. So he made nothing. Yeah. So that's his wealth. And he probably doesn't take income. Instead, reinvest it in the company. Also, he pays Amazon pays millions of dollars in other taxes, corporate taxes and other taxes to states and- then you look at the employees that he employs and the taxes that they pay. And so the, the, all the revenue that government's getting because of the inception of Amazon is like insane. The roof. Yeah, billions, but, billions of dollars. But here's the part that annoys the shit out of me. So I have people that were messaging me. So I did a DM, I did a post, right? My story. I'll read what I did. I, I posted a picture of the, 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 you know, the actual um, articles or whatever. Yeah, share that with Andrew so he has that. Yeah, I'm going to share that with him so, so he can read it. And so it says, you know, IRS launches investigation 
showing that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos paid zero income taxes. And I said, oh my God, they kept their own money. The gall of these people, how dare they risk their own capital and work their asses off to build companies that consumers find so incredibly valuable that they voluntarily give them billions of dollars and then legally pay only the taxes they're required to pay. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic. So I had people who were sending me DMs and like, well, they need to pay their fair share, which is, by the way, that's a political term. What the hell does fair share mm -hmm. actually mean? So I had this one guy who I talk to all the time and he's like, I bust my ass and I paid 30% income taxes. They need to pay their fair share. So, sorry. Well, first off, let's paint the context properly first. Let's talk about Jeff Bezos. Yeah. He is easily, Jeff, now I don't know of the guy, so I'm not saying I like him. I'm not saying he's a good guy. I'm just, this is just subjective. Yeah. He's easily one of the most productive and innovative people of all time. Yeah. And what I mean by productive is he actually created something that people valued so much that they voluntarily have given him billions and billions and yeah. billions of dollars. And the impact that he's had because of his innovations and his own uh, you know, willingness to risk his own capital has changed society so much that if Amazon disappeared today, we would be like... In a totally different place. So he right? started, I mean, it was basically like an online bookstore, like a struggling online bookstore. And then it just kept, it became like the store for everything online. A Amazon has dramatically increased well, you, efficiency, brought products to us, created businesses, not just employed people, but it's done. Yeah. You got so, being you gotta, infrastructure, you gotta, how, entertainment, how many, how many entrepreneurs that do you know actually make uh most of their money through Amazon. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, we have friends that have they built their all, businesses. All the there, multi million dollar companies that wouldn't they, be possible. That, yeah. They rely on their ability to market through Listen, Amazon. It's, it's impossible to quantify the incredible impacts. All we know is that it's obviously value so valuable that people have given them voluntarily. Nobody's forced them, but voluntarily given them billions and billions and billions of dollars. And so that's what he's done. So I said to this guy, I said, all right, Let's talk about fair share. You want to compare yourself to Jeff Bezos. Why aren't you producing your fair share of innovation and productivity? <laughs> because it would take a billion of you and what you do to do what he did for obviously society at large. Just to paint the right context. It just annoys me so bad because here you are. And again, I don't know the guy. I don't know what kind of person he is or whatever. But one thing I do know is because of him... Because of his innovations, because of his, his willingness to risk his capital and all that stuff, he's made such an incredibly positive impact as evidenced by the amount of money that people willingly give him um, that uh, rather than looking at him and saying, oh, I know we gave him our money voluntarily because he brought me a lot of value, but he needs yeah. to give up more of that for it. Also, Why? do you really think that a billion dollars with him would be less efficient and effectively used than a billion dollars to the government, the yeah. most wasteful <laughs> entity yeah. of all time. Yeah. Right. I don't understand why people can't just look at him like the Elvis of business. You know, like he's at the, he's completely like the king of business. Like yeah. he's, he's like mastered things that uh, people that are business owners can only dream of doing and, and has done it in such a way that like is, it, I mean, it's almost impossible to replicate what he's done. And sure. so to, to, to reward him in terms of like, that, that's just a signal of value that he's providing. Oh, look, I'll give you another example. It irritates the shit out of people, but it's true. Uh, like, let's look at like saving uh, trees, right? Trees are good. They give us oxygen. They clean the air. If we killed all the trees, we'd be in a big, pro you know, big trouble. What saved more trees? Environmental activists or innovations that now make us use email and digital uh, right. technology, right? right? So my point with that is this type of productivity innovation has tremendous, tremendous positive impact. And so I don't know, I, and you know, the problem is, is that politicians, they're very good at this. Nobody's better than politicians at this. They're very good at creating angles and demonizing people and then hitting your insecurities as a person to make you feel like that's a good thing, right? So rather than saying, you know, Jeff Bezos, Amazon has paid millions and millions and millions of dollars of taxes because it's not just income taxes, there's lots of other taxes. And Amazon has generated so much revenue for the government just indirectly and directly because of the companies that work with them and the people that buy their products and the employees that work there and all that stuff. Rather than saying all that, what they say is, you pay income taxes, he didn't, therefore he's evil. Mm -hmm. And people go, yeah, I think he's evil. But yeah. that's crazy to me. Well, it's really for the the shock value that you get from the title. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and that is what gets clicks. That's what gets people to read the article. 
And if you don't understand how business works, it's really easy to get fired up, share with your friend. Can you believe this? Yeah. You know, we're making women a wage over here and I'm getting taxed all this and this billionaire is not paying anything. Yeah, no. Like yeah. they just, you can't, you can't see that, right? You no. Know, they, don't, they, don't, they don't see that. And no, so, I, I'm, look, I, again, I don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy, but luckily. Yeah, no one's defending his character. Luckily, the way our market works is if you want money, you can be greedy or whatever. You still got to give people what they want to get it. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, he doesn't work for government. People who work in government get money because they legislate and force you. They don't do anything to earn your money. They actually force you to do that. He has made his money because so many people like what he does that they give it to him. Mm -hmm. So that's a great that's a, that's something that we need to consider and when you see these incredibly productive innovative people you got to yeah. think to yourself at what they've done, and you think, oh, "That's yeah, cool don't that you they want exist." More of them to exist. Yeah, that's cool that's that the they thing. exist and that they did this. You know, right? Speaking of uh, greedy and evil people, um, I was so impressed with Loki. Oh, the sh that oh, was a great a good, movie, right? I mean, well, great show, a series. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah, mean, yeah. it's only the first episode that they've released, but I was skeptical of it. I wasn't that excited to watch it. I was like, "Ah, oh, we'll see how it is." It. Uh -huh. um, Disney's got the best writers. Dude. You know, it, they're yeah. so good. It Them has, and HBO are the best. Now, you guys really didn't like the, you know, WandaVision and then the the. Um, I liked WandaVision, I liked it, yeah. but it took like four episodes, at least four, yeah. <laughs> which is good. well, and, and that's I think that's sort of the the conundrum that new content has coming out because it's it, it's like you're trying to develop all of these new characters, a totally different way of, of going through a story. And so that kind of had that. It's a whole new story when you think about it. It's just sharing characters from a... a yeah, it's not familiar right away, so you really have to stick with it. And then once you stick with it, it's it pays yeah. out. So, but, but Loki right out the gates. But yeah, Loki, yeah. It's it, good. It was very interesting right away. Very good. Premise. Now, do you like it the best out of those three, right? So the, the WandaVision, then the, what's, what was yeah. the other one? I cannot think of the, the title for the... Um, um, I did not like the... I didn't like the Hawk. In, winter, um, soldier yes, winter Soldier. Yes, Winter Soldier. No, Thank that's you. stupid. No. You didn't like that one. Nah. My buddy really liked that one. A really? Lot. Yeah, he, he liked Maybe them. I got to give it a better chance. Yeah, I he, watched two episodes. I don't like it. He liked them all. And it might be the same reason. It might just have taken, it might take more episodes to build the storyline. You know yeah. why I don't like it? Because, and this is my own bias, there's certain superheroes that I think are dumb, like uh, Hawkeye. Uh, I can shoot accurately. I don't care. That's the dumbest superhero I've ever <laughs> I, seen. Yeah. What a stupid. I, and then I agree with that. The, the, what's his, his name? Falcon? So I find that uh -huh. funny. I find that funny. Like you got high tech wings? I find that funny. <laughs> what are you doing? I find that funny that you guys well, you pick it apart like that's that. because we're nerds. About I know shit. because it's the whole fucking thing is over the top ridiculous. Well, here's the thing. It's like, <laughs> it's one thing to to create and develop the technology that produced like something crazy like those wings or like, like Why not to make just a jet? have it. It's yeah. like, okay, so you just. You just have cool shit, you know. Yeah, like, no. and you're, like you're, I'm supposed to think you're a superhero. Now, yeah, no. do do you know if uh, same writers are doing Loki as any of the other ones? It no has idea. a very uh, Mandalorian esque feel to me. Yeah, that's. I, I feel like it's written more like that than the other ones that we've seen so well, far. Well, Loki's so, such an interesting character because very, he, yeah. So he's the one always causing mischief and and all that. So I'm actually excited to see where it goes from there, even because yeah. um, that's interesting story writing. Yeah, but without giving it away, the angle and the twist that they used to start it off, I would have never imagined. And it was so it's so good. I'm so excited to watch. I can't wait for the second episode. Yeah. They did yeah. such a good job. Well, yeah. it's just funny because there's no other example really of constructing an entire universe of, of options than what Marvel's done so far. Even Star Wars, they're trying to catch up to that. It's it's so big and so vast. Uh, and to be able to connect all these different timelines and all these different stories and characters and combine them together, I mean, that takes a lot of brilliant writers. Is there a name for the style they used? Like, so Oh, I know what you mean in terms of the... Because there was a, a very stylistically speaking, without giving it away again, the tech that you see in Loki, it's advanced technology, but it looks mm -hmm. the yeah. way that you, you that 1960s sci-fi would have picked it, would have right. depicted. Well, yeah, technology. it's it's obviously in the future, but then there's things like a paper printer being done. Yeah, and like so there's these it's there's this contrast, right? Of like it's like, it's like Tomorrowland. Uh, yes. So, and which I love because. 
because they're they're sort of wrapping that in because in Disneyland you see their vision of what the future was going to look yeah. like. So it's got that 1960s it portrays feel. that a yeah, bit. Yeah. So is there? I, I've seen another show that did a really good job of this. Like and like I think the way you describe it sounds really good. It's like if it was 1960, this is what they guessed 2040 would look like. Yes. Yeah. And so some things you could tell maybe they got right, or some things are like, oh wow, they couldn't they couldn't see beyond the paper printer, and so that's still there. It's just stylistically very. But uh, what it, interesting. It, yeah. What is? Is there a name? Okay. For that? So they do this with steampunk, right? So the style steampunk is supposed to be like, like high tech, but yeah. with like old looking stuff. So but it's sort of Western looking antique stuff. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know what they would use for that. I don't, I don't know. Art. I mean, what would you do it? Art deco sci-fi? Like, I don't. I understand. bet you there's, I'm sure we're going to get a DM from somebody who's yeah, like, somebody knows. who's into this because I think there's got, there's got to be a name to that style because it's not. It's not so unique that you've never seen it before. I've mm -hmm. seen it done in movies yeah, before. Yeah, so there should be a name. And well, some, you, it, it didn't, like, was it The Fifth Element that did that well, too? Like, there's certain movies that have, have yes. played with stuff like that where like, uh, uh, something, uh, The Galaxy, I uh, forget what it's called, but, like, uh, some concept in Loki that I really liked was was the whole bureaucratic uh, element, and so they brought a lot of that into this. Yeah, which, like the, the DMV, like, inside yeah, there. They brought that in yeah. there, which is, I think, is brilliant. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where that series goes no sure. it's smart because especially with sci-fi sometimes sci-fi <clears throat> tries too hard to be accurately predictive mm. and so then it's kind of like, having fun with it a little yes bit. Mm. yeah like this makes it you want to watch it because stylistically it's appealing to right because like the, what you're talking about there's obviously things in it where you're like okay uh if this really were the future if this is really a future why they, would they have a he printer would, yeah like he that. wouldn't be using a print it does yeah. something like that yeah. just that's so outdated but it, it's funny and it's fun <laughs> So you I don't like need that. a punch card or you know yes. stuff like that. Like that's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. it's brilliant. It's it's br speaking of brilliant, by the way. Um, so I'm getting. I want to talk about this. No affiliation, but I want to talk about the, the company Stockpile. I think it's such a brilliant company. I love it. I love so, it. So so for people again, we have no affiliation whatsoever. But I discovered them back when Max, when Adam's son Max, how old was he? Was he? You gave it to me when he was born. When he was born, right? Yeah, yeah. You okay. Get, well, you've gifted him twice, but the the initial one, you were the one that introduced it to me. Um, and I think I was talking about how I want to find. I, this was before he was born. My biggest concern was I didn't want to spoil him with gifts and have all my. He's we have such a big family, Katrina's family, and so they just end up with too much. Yeah, and we were we were talking about different ways to invest for him or get the family behind doing that. And you introduced me to that by giving him. Yeah, it's so smart. Like you can literally go in there. You can create an account. You can go in there, and then you can gift a kid or whoever, and a dollar amount to be invested in any stock company or any company. And it doesn't have to be the 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 price of the share. So like let's say. A company's shares are at three hundred and forty-seven dollars. You could buy twenty dollars, fifty dollars worth, worth yeah. and they'll get fifty dollars worth of that share, yeah. and they make it easy. So, so you know, tomorrow's uh, uh, as of the recording of this, tomorrow is uh, Aurelius's baptism, which I'm super pumped about. Mm -hmm. It's like the big first big thing, you know, for my son. Yeah. And you know, in our tradition, you know, family, especially Italian families, they give money. They give a lot of money. And traditionally, what you do is you put it in a bank account, but then it just sits there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything, right? And so I, with Stockpile, I sent it to my whole family, and now they're sending me gifts of stock. And it's cool because either they'll pick a stock, which right. I think is cool, right? or they'll just give me amount and then I'll pick it myself. And now instead of it just sitting there, like my dream obviously with this is that, you know, Aurelius is 18, he's an adult, and I go, here's your investment account that you for your birthday, your baptism, your communion. You know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. People were investing in. Yeah, I like really it. Cool. It's they, really cool. They they also really simplify too, like with categories. So like, if you're interested yes. in like green tech and you don't know any companies or what like that, like it'll give you all the so smart. And then what is that called where you can you can invest in multiple like uh, mutual funds? Or? Yeah, where yeah. there's like three stock, like the three best stocks in this category, and then you can put and you can put any amount, like you said, if someone just gives you fifty dollars. Doesn't matter if that cost, uh, you know, four hundred something. It does, you can get a, a, a you know, part a partial. See stuff like this and Robinhood and all these apps that are making investing easy for the average person. Because it used to be unattainable in the sense that if you want to invest, it's like oh, I don't know what to do. I got to talk to like a stockbroker. Yeah, what do I do? Stuff, yeah. And I don't right. Yeah. But now they're making it so accessible. I can only see investment in uh, companies just continue to grow because the average person. Now it's easy. Oh, I can 20 bucks. I, well, I remember my very first, you know, Charles Schwab account that I opened up like a long time ago. And I remember being so discouraged because 
Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew I didn't know that, but I, I knew that I wanted to put some of my money. So I knew that was, everyone said it was smart to do that. And I go down there and you don't get any help. Like, and you, Unless have, you have like a quarter million, dollars. quarter million is the minimum. I know. And I, and here, you know, I was all excited. I'm bringing like my first 10 grand. I'm, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm like, right? I'm serious. Like I'm yeah. this, I'm serious about this stock thing. Here's my first 10 grand. And I'm like, yeah, can I get someone to help me? And they just kind of like chuckle at you. I know. Yeah. It happened to me too. Yeah. There's, you know, we have two quarter million to manage, you know, and then you got to pay, pay for that also. Right. So I was like, well, that's kind of yeah. stupid where this is definitely making it accessible for, for yeah. it pretty much anybody. Yeah. Now, speaking of stupid, you got it. Doug, can you pull up the pictures that I sent you? These are ads. I want to say from the sixties, just to show you how messed up. The marketing world is, and it's still messed up today. I think it's hilarious. But this will be, this makes it clear because now we know certain things. It's like when you see like old cigarette ads. You ever seen those old cigarette ads? Yeah, yeah. Four out of five doctors doctors recommends camels for, for coughs or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these, look at this. I don't know if you can you you can open that up. <laughs> sugar, this is sugar keeps your energy up <laughs> and your appetite down. These are ads. <laughs> From the sugar industry, and I want to say Both 60s- Both claims are already wrong. 60s yeah. or 70s. I sent you another one, Doug, if you could pull that one up. So the first one says, sugar keeps your energy up and your appetite down. And then there's another one that, what does that one say? Sugar can be the willpower you need to under eat. <laughs> so, in, and there's more, right? In these ads, they were, they were basically what they're pushing is they're saying that sugar is a great way to curb your appetite. And then it's got like a woman eating ice cream. Dude, that's it. crazy. The media is always pretty on point. So this, <laughs> yeah, is, this is really surprising. Look at their strategy is enjoy an ice cream before you have lunch. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's, it's I have to open these up. Look at this. I'll read that one. Man, here's what the and it's the it's the it's it's basically the sugar in I don't know organizations like they all came together. But it says when you're hungry, it usually means your energy's down. By eating something with sugar in it, you can get your energy up fast. In fact. Sugar is the fastest energy food around. Yeah. And when your energy is up, there's a good chance you'll have the willpower to under eat yeah. at mealtime. So how's that for a sweet idea? Sugar, <laughs> only 18 calories per teaspoon, and it's all energy. Brought to you by <laughs> diabetic pharmaceuticals. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Got you. Isn't that great? Wow. That's crazy. I like man. looking at stuff like this because it, it it's, e it's easy to see because it's old, so it's clear. But yeah. still, they do shit like this. That will, in 20 years, so we I mean, see where it stems from. Yeah. And is this actually just straight sugar advertising? Do they all get together? like and then? And, yeah. Okay. And then they were So it's ask. like the sugar industry, and yeah. because they have an ingredient and they want to promote it or whatever, so they're, they're showing you that sugar is great for. I don't know, willpower, <laughs> fat loss. That's so wild. <laughs> the funny thing is it does the opposite. Yeah, it yeah. literally does the opposite of what they're yeah. claiming. It's if hilarious. you're hungry, have sugar. It makes you hungrier. <laughs> yeah. It really does. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? Yeah. Uh, it's good I, for your teeth. I know, that's crazy. That Speaking funny. of consumers and markets, I read this cool, um, I don't know, I'm going to pull it up, this quote about consumer kind of demands and searches and stuff. So check this out. The popularity of internet searches for sustainable goods around the world, this is over the last five years, right? Mm -hmm. So people are now searching for sustainable goods or companies that have sustainable goods. In the last five years, it's gone up 71%. Wow. wow. So, so it's now become a it's, big it's a trend. market uh, driver where people are not just looking for good products, and this is more true for wealthy countries, they're also looking for companies that are environmentally uh, aware, yeah, Con and, conscious, and yeah, making so efforts. Mir, yeah. Thrive, Public, public Goods. goods. Yeah, they this all... made me think of Public Goods because yeah. that's like a big part of who they are, right? Yeah, yeah. They give you good products, super inexpensive, by the way. I'd save hella money yeah. shopping through them. Well, which used to be the big barrier because anytime you had uh, these types of like, messages out there, it was always like they'd slap like a, a higher price point on there. Yeah, yep. which I mean, understandable too. Though you kind of yeah. you. Had to before you did yeah yeah I mean if you're gonna go give if you're gonna go help uh you know get wa build wells you know in Africa somewhere right if you're gonna go do that and you're also gonna sell a product and you're also gonna make it like green yeah. and, you know you you're gonna spend more money so you, and oh. you normally have to charge the consumer but that was what was so brilliant about public goods basically becoming the you know Costco wholesale 
version of the, of those types of products was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's less expensive and environmentally yeah. conscious, yeah. which, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you beat that combination. Yeah, and, and we can reduce the amount of chemicals that we're exposing ourselves to, oh. which is what I really like to shop on public goods. Oh, yeah. So it's I actually, I, I, it's such good timing, too, because one of the areas they save a ton of money is in, like, the branding and stuff like that, and that's become very popular in the last decade. Like remember, like in the '80s and the '90s, like wild colors and yeah. crazy graphics and logos. Oh yeah. And now we're the the this generation is like simple, clean, mm -hmm. and and so the whole idea of this black and white, like one ingredient you see in a yeah. lot of companies doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So simple is definitely the the look today, which feeds perfectly into a company that's not spending a lot of money on doing a bunch of Dude, like cool stuff. Speaking of simple, mm. uh, the, the sushi guys that you had, uh, yeah, I, and I say simple because good sushi is not super complex or fat or fancy. Well, finally right? you guys exposed me to good sushi. Bro, well, I am what, so proud of you. I, that's really what I, that my desired outcome <laughs> of, of doing that. Cause I wasn't sure how you guys were going to receive it, um, to, to do it. So we had basically two sushi chefs, like come to real, the house. Like real ones. Like legit. Like from Japan. Yeah, like yeah. legit. Oh, yeah. dude, how cool was it when Doug, I'm so, Doug started speaking Japanese? I'm so them? mad that Missed we, did, opportunity. we did for the audience. We did not. There was a point in the night where we were having a great time, having drinks and just, you know, talking business. And, and, and the way the, the, the chefs do this is it's like, it was like a four or five hour dinner, right? So yeah, we're basically doing our business meeting, but they're bringing us this like incredible Food. Yeah, and at one point, uh, Doug breaks off and he's and he's talking in Japanese to the two guys back and forth, and I I nudge Sal and then Sal you know fumbles around to get his phone and by the time he gets over there, Doug's done talking to uh, him and I was like ah oh, that would have been such a cool clip for the audience to see Doug speak. I know, yeah, yeah. but but uh, I do want to say so for people who don't know, Justin is not a fish fan. No. At all, yeah. and I mean, one the time, band too, they and, suck. And, the, and <laughs> yeah. just so you know, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That. Fish. And one time, we were in Tahoe, and oh, we were God. all hungry, <laughs> and <laughs> and just and Doug, uh, Adam, and I were making fun of Justin for not eating yeah. sushi. Yeah. And we're like, oh, they might have fish sticks there. So we yeah, take like, him to a chicken a nuggets. Terrible, terrible sushi. Yeah. Spot. So we go to a sushi place. Finally, convinced Justin, he's like, "Fine, I'll try it." And it's the worst sushi <laughs> ever. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was, yeah, uh, it was awful. Gas station sushi, sushi was gross. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was pretty bad. <laughs> we won't name the company. And that yeah. ruined it. After that, Justin's like, "Never going to try it again." Yeah. Like, Fuck. No, I was done. Yes, but then you know, now we had these sushi set and and chefs come and Justin agrees. All right, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. What was like the, what what did was you the experience? Think? Yeah, experience for you. Yeah. So I mean, I. I was a little bit, uh, I was trying to like wrap my brain around it and not have the same associations. And so that's what I was just like really trying to, to focus on, man, this, like the preparation, the freshness of it, like the authenticity of the cooks that were preparing it, all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to focus on all that. And then um, the first the first round of what they presented would just looked amazing. So that the presentation of it was, you know, part of that whole experience was helpful for me. And then I started eating it. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, this is this is tasty. I can give this a go. Uh, there's some stuff I still, it's yeah, just, you I just don't like. You didn't have the oyster. I, I didn't have the oyster. <laughs> Too I, far. I, yeah, yeah, I just, I'm slurping, you gotta, yeah, slurping you, that in is just not, it, I just can't do it. You're not ready for that. I'm not yet. ready. Yeah. Maybe uh, baby steps. You did way better than I did the first time I had sushi. Yeah. Yeah, I know people watching right now who are young are like, what are you talking about? Listen, I feel like a little kid talking about dude, it. This is fucked up. 20 years ago, <laughs> like sushi was a big, like if you went to one, I was like, oh my God, we weren't like popular like that are now and the first time i had sushi was california is that rolls. true they, they're not they're they're way more popular today is that true Doug? oh yeah is dude. he talking about the side of his neck has it always been like a thing <laughs> no, the side of his neck yeah no no when i was when i was a, oh, yikes when i was a kid i'd never even heard of it yeah really yeah no okay. dude my kids now grow up eating it i didn't have sushi for the first time since i mean i, was in I didn't 20s. either but i also grew up in like the you know freaking uh, valley in like Koda. Koda. yeah, yeah but I bet, I bet there's yeah. sushi restaurants there yeah. now you I, might find one or yeah, two. There might be one. There. Be. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a it's a small town and like it's a, yeah. There's not a lot of culture there. No. <laughs> so, but so you did better than I did my first time. Now, how did you feel after? Because one of the things that I like about sushi, especially good, especially like the simple stuff. Yeah, is you just feel so good. You yeah, digest it was, easy and totally. It was easy. It was light. Like I yeah, I felt like. I, you know how you feel like a weight after you eat a really like heavy meal, mm -hmm. like like none of that. I just felt like good. 
Yeah, it so, was really, it was yeah. really good. That was, I appreciate. I that, enjoyed Adam. it. Yeah, it was a good time. That was a very good. time. Yeah, I know. It was a really. I had a really good time. I had a great. Uh, uh, Justin invited this uh, designer guy over, who Sal, Doug, and I had never met before, and we had great conversation. And I mean, sure, we were up till almost midnight just chopping it up and stuff. So that was a, a really, really good time. Yeah, yeah. good time, good, yeah. good conversation. So, are, am I going to see you guys at the bat prison? Yeah, yeah, tomorrow? yeah. Okay. We'll be there. Although I am not. I was just telling Katrina that because it's tomorrow, tomorrow morning. That's and, the church. Yeah, and the way back to my place is so. This is going to be the first like seventies day in in my place. Oh no! So everybody, and it's a weekend. Oh yeah. Oh no! So I'm pretty much like set up for a good two and a half hour drive plus home from oh. your place. So <laughs> I told you. You mean this is after the reception? Or yes. Oh, because yeah. it's going to be like midday. That's right. It's going to be midday Saturday on a 70-something degree day. It's going to be the day to go to the beach. That It's a first, like, really beautiful yeah. day. We'll make I'm... sure and bring that up, you know, to Aurelius. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll let him yeah. know. You know yeah. I made this, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, Dude, the be cool, real you're passive you're aggressive all, yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, your Uncle yeah. Adam sat in traffic your for Adam was four hours to get to see some sprinkled car. water on your forehead, just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know what's really cool is that uh, Father Steve agreed to come up. I am really excited to see him. So he's the producer he's one of the producers or the producer of the word on fire uh show so bishop baron who we've had on he's the, show. the buff priest yeah. he's the guy we talked about he's jack yeah, he's like he, the 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 spiritual enforcer yeah, yeah. <laughs> he like he works out looks like a, he works ah. out all the time and he's all fit you know and he's super cool and he's in la and it was like a shot in the dark i'm like hey would you like to come up and do this absolutely yeah so he's coming up to do it for no, us which that's, is really, that's really cool i'm yeah. i'm excited now is he is he already here is he staying the is he get, flying in tomorrow i think he's probably i think he's flying in this afternoon and do you know where he's staying because I, I don't you're, because aren't I, you guys putting him up i thought you were you were, i'm paying uh, i i told him i'd reimburse them and okay. he by the way turned it down and i had to insist okay like what a nice guy man. i know yeah what a nice guy yeah. i sent him some uh, i think i sent him some ro whey protein and creatine <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's all into that, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really cool. Stay jacked. Yeah. So, hey, did you know that the? I'm going to bring this up, Justin. I don't know if you knew this or, or, or not. Did you know that they're thinking about bringing back uh, supersonic air travel? The FAA is 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 like talking about it. What? Yeah. So, do you remember the Concord? Uh -huh. Jet was I've that what it was called the Concord? So it goes way up in the atmosphere. It was the one with the where the nose was kind of pointed down a little bit, and it traveled supersonic. Was it on the pod? Sorry, I'm gonna like take a left turn a little bit here, but was it? I feel like we did we share this on the podcast? Or was that the conversation we had the other night about the uh, Blackbird that flew to Europe in? We talked about that. Oh uh, last yeah, night. it was like or a couple night. hours or something. Yeah, it wasn't. Oh, so it, it, wasn't it went from it went from L.A. This is the Blackbird. This is not commercial, but the Blackbird fastest plane ever produced went from L.A. to London in three. Three hours, a little over three hours. When you guys said <laughs> that, I was so like, insane. "Holy shit, that's insane!" Yeah, it's, it's, it's literally a spaceship. I mean, attached to. But that also gives me hope that we're not that far away from commercial travel mm. be potentially being there, right? Well, I mean, if that if we got, I mean, that would be so. Expensive. Well, I mean, that's what SpaceX and Blue Origin and yeah. all they're all working on all that kind of stuff for for space travel to be like from here to uh, the moon or Mars eventually. But just to, just to, or on the other side of the planet. Just to ma exactly, or, yeah, or that. Too. Just imagine what that what that would open up if you could get across the world like that that fast uh -huh. um and then obviously do it in a, in a reasonable i know it's going to be expensive but everything is i mean a cell phone yeah. just yeah, but, if, but if, I, if i have to wear a mask i'm not gonna do it <laughs> okay so that's, that's really where i'm at you know that's so we're waiting right now um you know my best friend invited us down to do uh, disneyland in august uh for their, their son is uh you know, my godson is, is three and a half going to be four and they're going to go down to Disneyland and I told Katrina I was like oh, I wanted to wait till Max is a little bit older but you know what the hell maybe we'll go and actually what's keeping us from booking it right now is that the the law is still right now for a two-year-old on the plane oh and I just know that I and he's I, just going to be like oh yeah it off it's just not going to happen yeah. and then I don't and, and, and then they'll kick you off yeah and I don't even want to be in that yeah, situation like I'm not I don't even want to put myself in that situation yeah because you know how you're going to want to react yeah I don't know how I would yeah exactly so I'm like I just if that's going to be the rules and that's the rules I'm we're not going to go so yeah we're on the fence right now for that same reason I don't know what's going to happen I know we were originally everything was supposed to be lifted in California like this this coming week and that's all switched no, up it. yeah magically June fifteenth and then it didn't happen so yeah. do you guys, do you, now do you guys know what is go going to happen like i don't i have no idea i'm not i, following. I don't you guys yeah. don't at I don't. this point it's just what they'll, they'll just say something and not come through no. yeah, so it's i i don't I anyway don't, sorry i, I, no so, right. but yeah. I distracted so you so check this out so united airlines <clears throat> is going to build or purchase 15 supersonic uh, jets 
and the FAA, FAA is probably going to accept these. Wow. And then, yeah, because now the, I'm sure it'll be for expensive. commercial use. Commercial use. And and what is the now? Obviously, the Blackbird was is much right. faster. No, but this, this how, not, how fast well, are we talking about cutting trips in half in a quarter oh, faster? Oh, how, wait, dude, dude wait. tell me, tell me. I don't know. Well, okay. What what businesses are are behind this too? Is it like but, Boeing and you know some first? Of those I want first. I want to know like how much faster this yeah. is going to be. Like oh, it, they're supersonic. They'll fly sixty five to eighty eight people in the planes. Okay. Um, and the, it, they're saying it'll be the goal is to do it by twenty twenty nine. So they're twice as fast. Okay. Twice as fast. So you cut your fly time in half. So San Francisco to Sick. Tokyo, San Francisco to Tokyo is six hours instead wow. of 10 hours, wow. over 10 hours. That's, that's amazing. Yes. So this is a good, this is, I mean, this is kind of cool. Now remember the Concord <coughs> was doing this and then it just, they weren't making much money mm. and people, you know. Oh, whatever. they tried to do this already. You don't remember the Concord? So 2029, we're going to Australia. That's no, nice. that's no, tell me. I don't Doug, look up the Concord. When did the Concord? So uh, who, who, who owned that? What, or what air, did an airline company own that? Yeah. Or try to, did they try to start? So the Concorde is a, is the name of the jet, and then mm -hmm. airline companies owned it. So like Boeing makes the jet. Yeah, they and make then, the I plane. think it was Air France and maybe British Airways. Oh, and they had it? Yeah, maybe Doug can look up and Now pull back up to Justin's, while you're looking at that up, Justin's question was, is it Boeing that's actually building it? I didn't, I didn't say I mean, it just seems like a smart, a smart stock buy, if that's the right. case. Yeah. Right? That's what I was curious. That's actually not a bad, that's not a bad uh, uh, point there. I don't know. I, I'd have to read the whole article to see. The the, the Jet itself is called Overture. Huh. Overture is the name of it, but I don't know. The new one, not the old. The, the old one was one. called, you said Concord? Concord yeah. yeah the, okay, this is it right here. British that's Airways. The British Airways. Wow, in 1986? No, 76 to 2003. No, it says 1986. No, right here. It says operated oh, from 1976 oh, 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 oh. to 2003. So, yeah. I mean, it went for, okay, so do you know why it stopped? It was too expensive. Huh. It just wasn't uh, commercially feasible. Yeah, they weren't affordable. making they weren't making much money. So do they have? I mean, do they have to climb a significant amount higher in altitude to sure, pull this out? Right. Sure. So what what does that look like in terms of, um, I guess turbulence and, and so in terms of like yeah oxygen. From what I read, is it better or worse higher? It's, it's got to be better. Better. Right? Yeah. So higher you go, the, the better. Clouds. And That's what I was gonna say. From what I read about the Concorde, is it was a smoother flight. Yeah. Because you were so much higher, yeah. and there's less, you know, resistance uh, flying at that speed. Mm. I mean, it's super rad. Now, I did, you, I was a huge fan. Of so, it. do you know the economics of this one? Like, is it going to be really expensive? Also, again, I mean, it's got to be more expensive. There's no way you get to cut your flight time in half and then you get the same price. Yeah, or else I, it would oh, yeah. obviously sell out. Well, I mean, think about it this way: Do you have you ever seen how much first class costs international? Yeah, it's expensive. Oh, it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Do you know what the price is? Is it like ten thousand dollars for a ticket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's really expensive. So you know, have you remember when? Uh, so who I know, Mark Cuban has one. There was that was like one of the biggest uh, mess ups. Doug, I know you know this. It's, it's been oh, a, when they offered a lifetime. Yes. Light, light, uh, yeah. What was it? Remember that? Do you, what? What did it? What, it was a ridiculous I think price. It was American Airlines. Though. It was for lifetime. Yeah. It travel. was right after like one of our crashes or something. They were trying to find a way to get money. They offered these lifetime, basically for like a hundred thousand dollars, something like that. Yeah. It was a, it was a it was a pretty steep price, but but the know, amount these guys use it, <laughs> yeah. Saving like I mean, yeah, no, they they won, and I know I believe Mark Cuban. I think I remember one of his books I was reading. I know he's got it. I think also uh, what's the guy? Oh, who it was two hundred and fifty thousand dollar lifetime ticket. Yeah, and they actually lost money. Because you had people who traveled so much. Well, you just think like you just gave the ten thousand dollars for a first class. If you're like, okay, wait a second, to go to Tokyo, ten thousand uh, dollars first class. Yeah, I fly six times a year. Yeah, six times a year. In about five years, I'm going to get my money back. Exactly. Like, this is a no brainer. And it's lifetime. Yeah, and, it's, <laughs> and of course, it actually all that stuff went way up. So, I know. Yeah, those guys. Have made you guys out, ever yeah. seen the first class? How many of those planes? Or how many of those tickets were? Sorry, dude. How oh. many, so twenty eight. 28 Lucky Bastards, is that what I'm reading? Yes, 28. Oh, wow. Of which one was Mark Cuban? Mark Cuban's one of the 28. Wow. Yeah. That is hilarious. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So have you guys ever seen the first class videos? I don't remember the name of the plane. I want to say it's a Middle Eastern. Oh, it's the Dubai trip. Oh, it's, my. Yeah. Have you seen these yeah, videos, yeah. Justin? No, I haven't. Uh -uh. Bro, it's like, uh, it's like a five-star more yeah. hotel. Yeah, yeah. Like room and setup, but on the plane. Huh. Like with a bed and TVs and massage. And, and it's food. not a private jet. This is like commercial. It's commercial, but yeah. it's first class and it's extremely expensive wow. and it's ridiculous. And I think the whole plane is Dubai like that, is right? so is it, opulent. It, like everything about Dubai. I remember I that one is it hotel all, you showed me yeah. <laughs> that was with the Atlantis or something. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. It was had, man, you, you could like sleep underneath the water uh, that's in your so, room that's or something. That's so cool. Yeah, look, Crazy. Look at right. these pictures of these, uh, of these, these like, 
rooms and stuff where they sit in. It's Emirates. Emirates, Emirates. yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, That's the name of the plane? I think it is, yeah. yeah the airline, yes. Yeah, but there's What's, one... There's, find out what a ticket costs. Oh, you know what? It's crazy. Okay, so you guys know that we brought up on the show the other day um, the gold steak I brought up. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. So our really good friend, shout out to Jordan Shallow, just had his birthday, and he was out in Turkey, and the, he has one of those restaurants there. And there, I forget what's the currency there, but whatever the currency there, it's like a thousand of the liras. I think it's liras. No, liras are a time. Oh, it's not Old liras. Time. Oh, I don't know. I'm this is Turkey. Not, I, I don't have no know. idea. Yeah, I don't Gobblers. know. Gobblers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Giblets. I'll pr- pretend like I know. A thousand whatevers. You know, Stuffing. cranberry sauce. A thousand Pokemons. Okay, so that's a so. The new lira. Huh? It's called the new lira. Oh, it is. Oh, oh, you're so, right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. My look bad. At, look one at Adam me, coming in me. hot. Yeah. yeah. Damn. God's out. He knows stuff. Uh, Dang. Yeah. <laughs> stay, <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> I know things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyways, so he, uh, so here in LA and in uh, Miami, the, the minimum steak. And this is a steak with wrapped in gold yeah, leaf. Yeah, the gold leaf, right? Mm-hmm. I shared about it before, which I, I don't know if. if, yeah. if uh, with the guy that does the whole sprinkle thing. Yeah, yeah. The like, salt bay. Warm. The salt bay. Okay, so if he has another location like that he's like wrapped into this whole experience how does he duplicate that over he just there? yeah no he just he drops in on he was at the one in turkey when uh jordan was there see that's crazy so he just kind of he bounces around but i think i actually think that's actually probably most of what he does now is fly around to his he la my yeah, just caters <laughs> yeah just does this and, and cut stuff for yeah. celebrities yeah exactly and he shows up to some of these uh tables and and does that so i think that's kind of like part of why you do the experience is the chance that he may mm-hmm. show up at the restaurant and do these things i see so anyways the reason why i was bringing it up was that they can get away with this bullshit in LA and in Miami, so it's the minimum is if you want a gold steak, you're spending 650 US minimum 650 US dollars, and most of them are a thousand and above. Right. In Turkey, he told me that it cost him 150 bucks. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For that gold wow. steak. Uh-huh. That's whack. Well, that's yeah, markets, just, dude. Yeah, but you know, ramp but, that price. But up. I think it was one of you when I brought that up said like, well, fuck, you could get on a plane, almost private, and fly <laughs> fly to right. Turkey. And actually get the steak and save the money. And have a vacation. Yeah, so if you were thinking about getting the steak in L.A., <laughs> maybe consider getting on a private plane, flying over yeah. to Turkey and having like, your steak. Hmm. I've always wanted to go there, by the way. Have you ever seen their like their, their <laughs> architecture? And It's gorgeous, beautiful uh, stuff. I always is, wanted to go isn't there. Isn't Gobekli Tepe there, too? I have or? no idea. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's one of those uh, crazy. I've always wanted to go there. No idea what's the name. <laughs> ancient. It's like this ancient. All I know is or the currency. They uncover. I know. I know. I'm, I'm yeah. into all the like like ancient to, relics and stuff. So I'd like to convert my dollars to giblets, please. <laughs> Excuse <laughs> me, sir. Yeah, and some stuffing, dude. I, I had like no uh, uh, stuff to bring up today, dude. I feel bad, other than a few stupid things. Like, so one thing. Did you know it's physically impossible to lick your elbow? Yeah. Yeah. I did. I tried that. Man. <laughs> Yeah, I've tried I mean, who has it, right? You can't lick your elbow. I mean, we've tried lots of things. I mean, I can that, lick. That was one. I, can I was lick, like, oh, I can lick your. I feel elbow. like I can though. It's, like, yeah. <laughs> it's so close. I can lick your elbow. Can't no, lick my it. elbow. No, I can pick your nose, but not friends. That's, I'm it, not gonna lick your. That's elbow. your best random fact. That's for the it. Day. That's it. <laughs> that's that, that my tongue. Like, <laughs> every, every, every tongue has its own uh, uh, signature well, thumbprint. Since we're talking about weird stuff, I watched a video on the difference between male and female orgasms, and this is because of that podcast that we listened to on the way here. The one with the testosterone, the lady on Joe oh, Rogan. Yeah, yeah. Justin said he listened. The rest of it was not happy. Dude, really? and all they're doing is crying like half the uh, episode. Dude, man. Rogan like sidetracked the shit out of that episode. Uh, but anyway, she. It, it, well, the, call. Let's get her on the show. We'll the, get her on the, the show. It's it's a book about testosterone and its effects on on men and women. It's really interesting conversation. She talked about orgasms because she said that oh, people yeah. who this transition was, this was fascinating, very fascinating. She said people who go from female to male in transition, so they're given testosterone. Notice a difference in their orgasms, even if they don't get you a know, signif- surgery. A significant difference. Yes. Yeah. And so I, that, that made me wonder, like, what, what are the differences? So mm-hmm. here's what we know so far. A man's orgasm is more acute and yeah. focused. Localized. Just localized, boom, right sharp, H- harder and, acute, and shorter. And shorter. Yeah. A woman's orgasm is more Systemic. full body. Yeah. Not as like acute, but more spread out and lasts longer. Yeah. And what's fascinating, according to that woman, is that when females transition from female to male, that happens to them. All of a sudden, their orgasms become more acute, more localized, sharper, and shorter. Mm-hmm. How weird. So this I, it makes me want to talk to somebody who's transitioned and ask them, like, well, what do you like better? 
Yeah. Yeah. You've experienced. Be, I'm definitely curious. Right. I mean, doesn't that. Uh, that and, and two, because, you know, the, as, as far as the full body experience, it takes a while to get into that headspace and all that kind of stuff for it to happen versus like, I wonder if it's like a lot easier to have like orgasms and more frequently, you know, the opposite. You wonder if it's easier well, for I, men to have orgasms? <laughs> no. For the for the woman that now has. Oh, oh that's a good Transitioned. Question. I would I would probably think so because testosterone is such a driver of sexual yeah. um, you know desire mm -hmm. that it, and that's yeah. what she said too she said that what was it I'm aware of my own orgasm give her her give her, her her plug what is she, she's a, she wrote, oh, I forget gosh. the name of the book she's a Harvard professor her name was Carol uh, Hoo, Car Hoo, 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 Hooven Hooven I think Carol Hooven I think Let I think that see. might be it. Carol yeah, Hooven is. Is let that me right? see I just ordered her book that's yeah and it's what was the book the the T the T I'll I'll pull it up right now yeah I mean we should probably yeah. give her some love yeah so I because it was really good. I mean, she you could tell she knew. Her I'm shit. fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm so interested in yeah. in this in this book. In which the okay. story of testosterone, the hormone that dominates and divides us. Carol Hooven, H O O V E N. And you already emailed her, right? Yeah, I did email her. Yeah, but yeah, so um, yeah, she said this was what I thought was interesting on the podcast that women that transition to man, they take the testosterone and they go through this similar feelings that guys go through when we go through puberty. Mm -hmm. And she was referring particularly to the insatiable over like the, the overwhelming sex drive and, and desire. I mean, this listen, this is the deal, okay? If you're watching this on YouTube, you're probably a guy, so you understand what I'm talking about. But when you're a guy and you go through puberty, it is overwhelming. It is not it is a very interesting period. You're literally horny all the time. And she said that these women, when they transition for the first six months or so, they go through this feeling and they're like, oh my gosh, this is what it's like. Well, I have to share with the audience too what a, what a nerd you are. When we're in the car listening to this, this is my this is my science nerd friend here, like yelling at the radio when Joe's like making a mistake. <laughs> yeah. No, Joe! This is <laughs> sound of, no, no, he's yelling at the, at the, t or at the radio, hoping that uh, Carol circled. And she did, she circled back. I know. Because Joe was trying to make this case that then why it's so weird that women dress with like you know yeah why do women dress uh typically? so provocative and, yeah, and like, men don't and 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 she she well she was going on this tangent trying to say that it's so strange and Sal's like no it's really not when you think about what the, the, it's if they're trying the other, if you're trying to attract opposite? a mate if you're yes. trying to attract a mate men do the exact same thing but that's not how we attract we right. do it with status yeah exactly if I if I walked in in, in little booty shorts and my <laughs> chest hanging out <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't you attract, might attract some guys that's right I wouldn't attract yeah, more women true. women that way but if I show up in my Lambo and I've got my you know Louis Vuitton right. shoes and my Rolex watch I'm more likely to attract more or, that way or and, so, you, and so guys do it just as crazy yep. yeah. as as women do they that extreme. peacock in different ways. That's yeah, right. or just being like sense of humor. You ever look at what people rank uh, for <clears throat> humor number one for women? Humor's always in the top three or why, top five. Why, why? Do you know why? Because evolutionary wise, sense of humor. If you have a good sense of humor, because life was really funny. shitty for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, life yeah. sucked for a really long yeah, time. Yeah, so yeah, if you were fun with if you were yeah. funny, you gotta, we're gonna get, I'm gonna get dysentery and fucking die. So <laughs> no, it's because if you have a great sense of humor, you probably Probably have high status. Mm -hmm. It's it's a part of charisma. If you're funny and people want to be around you really? in, your, in your tribe or society, yeah, sense of humor's always placed a man in higher status. People want to be around you, they want to hear you talk. So it's like charisma. Charisma is the same thing. Men, women look for charisma more in men than men look for it well, in women. Back to kind of like what I found fascinating about that conversation was as they were going through that process, like a young teenage boy going through puberty, like I'm talking about like a woman tra tra transitioning to a man, uh, that that basically they, they couldn't help but start to objectify women. Yes. If they were attracted to women, that is. But uh, that that was very fascinating to because it is so... Uh, I mean, it, it, it's such a powerful thing too, and it's taboo to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, every young boy knows wh what that feels like in terms of just uh, it's hard to control and, and realize like how how much drive you have towards sex, and then trying to to calm down and control it. Oh, don't I remember as like a you know fifteen, sixteen year old boy like having a girlfriend, and if she like I couldn't sit by her and not want to do 
sexual stuff and i would like like cry bro if she, <laughs> if she would turn me down if she'd be like no i want to watch no, let's the, watch the you movie. feel no, rejected she, yeah You're no just I, like oh i'm rejected i want to watch the movie and yeah. but it but i you know logically and look outside well, yeah now you're a wiser right, older man. like I, you you think like oh my god dude you couldn't even sit still for a fucking two-hour movie know, bro dude. like calm the fuck down but you don't feel that way when you're that eight it's so uh it, it almost feels uncontrollable that you just keep attempting and keep attempting and you keep attempting and just no 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 yeah please 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 <laughs> you know until finally like oh you know yeah. got all emotional about it but that's i mean i remember feeling so controlled by that 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 urge for so many years yeah, as a, as a just, young man it, yeah it just takes over all of your thoughts it's, yeah. a, it's a strong driver and, it's, it's until uh stress and life hits you and fucking drops your yeah. testosterone right. <laughs> yeah. well no i also just think you just start tapering off you, yeah. you start to understand look here's the deal like same thing with teenage girls like I, I had i have two older sister or two younger sisters i remember when they went through puberty they got feelings that they weren't familiar with, and it was hard for them to control mm -hmm. themselves as well. You're just young. You're, you go from being a child to now having the testosterone of a man. You don't know what to do with it, and it's overwhelming. Now, when you're a man, even if you have high testosterone and you're in your 40s, yeah, you're it's right. not the same. You're wiser. You understand it. You know how to process it and deal with it. But when you're 13... And you're like, you were a child, you know, last month. Well, yeah. And now you have, like, when you're 13, you're trying to process that. You're like, what is this crazy yeah. feeling? What am I supposed to do with this? I gotta yeah. go take a two hour shower, mom. I'll be back, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, this, <laughs> this yeah. is what happens, dude. <laughs> yeah. Hey, real quick, before we get to the second part of this podcast, uh, I wanna talk to you about our sponsor, Blue Chew. And this is a great company that provides you with medication that has the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. But it's all done online. So you don't have to go to the doctor, go to the office, talk to someone in person. You do it all online, and then they mail the product to your door. This is for male performance in the bedroom, which we all know is extremely important. So if you like those pumps in the biceps, improve those pumps down below. It's good stuff. Remember, the process is simple. So what you do, you sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. Once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. Again, it's all done online. Use our promo code. You'll actually get a free sample. Just pay $5 in shipping. So you go to bluechew.com, use the promo code MINDPUMP, and you can actually get your first month for free. All right, enjoy the rest of the podcast. First question is from Reward PT Movement Coach. Full range of motion during bodybuilding exercises, always or partial reps to keep tension on muscles for a bigger pump or both. Okay. So if, if we're going to do a head to head competition, cause there's value in both and we'll explain why, but if we're going to do a head to head competition, full range of motion, generally speaking is going to give you better results. You have a, a larger <clears throat> range of strength that you gain because it's relatively specific to the range that you train in. So in other words, if I squat 12 inches, I'm going to get 12 inches of strength. If I only squat six inches, I'm mostly only going to get six inches of strength. So that's obviously valuable. Also, full range of motion tends to build more muscle generally because you're training the muscle uh, as the muscle fibers slide past each other and contract in larger ranges of motion. You just get more stimulus uh, when you do that. Now, he mentioned tension, keep tension. Here's a myth. You can keep tension in full range of motion just yes. like you can with partial not, range. Not of only can you, you're supposed to. Yes. Yeah. So like like one, you know, people might say, "Oh, don't go all the way up for a shoulder press because if you do then you lock out and you take off tension." No. If you go all the way up, you don't rest it on your joints. You have to keep tension the whole time. So as far as keeping tension is concerned, if you do it right, full range of motion keeps tension the whole time just like short ranges of motion do. Now, where do short range of motion have value? when I'm trying to specifically add strength to a range of motion that I'm challenged with. So yeah. let's say in my bench press, the top portion, the lockout is where I find I struggle. So I notice I'm really good until I get to lockout and then it's really, really hard. Well, if I do some sets of short range of motion bench press, focusing just on lockout, then I'll improve that particular part of the range of motion. Well, you see power lifters uh, a lot of times like really focusing on that or doing like rack specific yes. pulls and things to address 
uh, if, if they're going to piece it out uh, in terms of like uh, you know different parts of the left, they can then see where their weakness lies, and let's like work just in that direction. But uh, you know, in terms of bodybuilding, I mean, you see this all the time where they're trying to they, they call it like what like the squeeze the the peak yeah. of like of a bicep curl or something like that. Uh, I used to do this all the time. Um, I used to chase the pump. I used to do short reps. Uh, rarely ever do I do it anymore. The only time I do it, and I think uh, you recently, Sal, and I think it was your Instagram, you talked about this. It might have been on the show. Uh, you talked about how you like to use supersets when you f are cutting. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is just like the whole 20 minute hit workouts, si mm -hmm. similar type of concept here. Th this way of training has value, has tremendous value, but you don't want to get stuck in training like this all the time. So then the next question is, okay, well, where do you implement this type of yeah. training? Well, you know, there's not this set rule of this is when best to do it, but this is how I prefer to use it. Since when I'm on a when I'm on a cut like you and I'm reducing calories, one of the first things that happens is I lose strength. It's just part of the process. Mm -hmm. You're eating way less food consistently. You're not going to be as strong as when you're fully fed. That's just a fact, right? And you're cutting, you're catabolic, so you're going down. So you're going to lose strength. So one of the best things mentally to do is to don't worry about how heavy the weight is. And so that's when I love to switch to lightweight, do these pumping type of reps just to send blood in there, get this workout, get this burn. And that's how I'll intermittently put them into my workouts is I don't feel strong today. So I might head into a workout thinking that I'm going to do full range of motion and strong lifts and go, oh my God, I am so weak today. But instead of getting so hung up on like, oh, I had to lift heavy and a certain way ah, today i'm gonna you know i'm getting a nice pump i'm not mm -hmm. i'm gonna lighten the load i'm just gonna pump some blood in there and so long as you are mostly training in full range of motion that's also not going to hurt you yes right if you're somebody who the people that are at most risk here are are, are the people that always train for the pump and shorten range of motion up that is not ideal you train long. your body to move that way that's right that, that is not an ideal way to train long term now if you train full range of motion 90% of the time, to me, it's great yeah. to do this every once in a while. And when I find- There's value in a new stimulus. That's right. But in terms of what the question's asking, I would have to go full range of motion oh, yeah. all day long. If you're going head to head and you had to pick one, I mean, yeah. there's no there's no comparison. But I mean, I'll give you an example for me. Like for a long time, I did this bodybuilding style overhead press where I stopped every rep Right about here, and right? he dropped at ninety degrees. Yes, this? this was and, a this was a shoulder a bodybuilder shoulder press. Yes, yeah. and the first time I figured out that a full range of motion worked was when I started to do real overhead presses and go all the way down to my upper chest, and I got more muscle growth. Still didn't do full lockout, and then I met Justin, and Justin talked all about overhead carries. Overhead carries are hard if you don't train it with that full range of motion. Yeah. And I noticed I was hella weak. I was like, "Whoa, man! Holding something straight up above my head and keeping tension is hard for me." So I started doing overhead carries to make up for it, and again, I got just way more strength, stability, and I built a little bit of muscle. So this theory, this whole why it's in the bodybuilding community is the thought. The thought because this is what I used to think too: is it's time under tension, and I used to think yeah. that you're losing that tension when you're at the end ranges of motion, right? Right. And that's just not true. And so, yes, to Justin's point, if we were to compare them head to head, full range of motion wins all day long but i do think that there are are places to play with the short pumping reps yeah. mm -hmm. it should just be again that's why i like to use the example of the 20 minute hit workout you, i don't think there's a lot of value in training 20 minute hit a lot or all the time i think that your body will get adapted to it and most of those great benefits that all the studies talk about are in that short six week window after that it starts to diminish mm -hmm. But there's still tremendous value in it. So use it when it makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. When you only got 20 minutes, great time to do a 20-minute hit workout. Or, hey, when you're in a cut and you know you're going to be weaker, don't worry about doing the heavy full range of motion. Maybe that's the day you do some pumping reps. Next question is from Kayla Roche. Is there a difference between cardio from running and cardio from pushing a heavy sled? Or are they the same because of the elevation of the heart rate? No, oh, they're totally different. Totally yeah. different. Here. One is more a steady state. You're going to build endurance. It's Your body's going to try to become more efficient at doing it. The other one is more like strength training. Well, you yeah. have to, we, have, we have to cover why someone would ask this because to us, that's very obvious and easy. But where there's this – so I get asked like, you know, well, is, is, is doing the stair climber – 
uh, less is, is going to build more muscle than doing running on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. And that is, in, that is, I think a, a little more nuanced right. than, than something that's obvious. Like a sled, if you're, if you're putting a sled, a couple hundred pounds on a sled and you're pushing it 50 yards to, yeah, or 10, 10 yards or yeah, 10 steps forward. Yeah. That's closer well, to, unless you're doing like an entire football field, you, you know, with the sled, <laughs> yeah. then, then it can turn into a that's, bit of a cardiovascular That's right. Exercise. So if you were doing like a, a 10 pound sled, which is like nothing, right. And yeah. you're, you're pushing it, it for it's a mile. It's the intention, I think is the point the, of it. So you have to discern what, what what it is you're doing with the object or with your body. Uh, you know, obviously elevating the heart rate, you're going to get that from even weight training, but yeah. uh, it, in short bouts. And so if, if it doesn't cross over into that endurance, uh, you know, energy exchange, then I would I would classify it more like as a strength type. Yeah, of Yeah, I mean, it's a. Uh and the the heavier the load and the shorter the distance that you push it, the more like resistance training it becomes. The lighter the load and the further you can push it, the more like cardio it, it right. is to keep it simple for somebody. Yes, and, and pushing a heavy sled. I mean, I do this typically on Saturdays and I'll do, I'm probably pushing it a grand total of 40 yards. It's very much like strength training. Yeah. I mean, your heart rate gets up. So does my heart rate when I do 20 rep squats, too. I love yeah. it. I actually wish that we could sort of classify this more as like work capacity because it is like strength training, but also, I mean, you are you have to move with it's, yeah. it's It's kind of a different uh, mentality doing that exercise, but it's still providing a lot of strength benefit. I, I, I feel if you're doing it in short distances and you're, you're moving weight. Next question is from Connor Sherry. What are the best snacks and quick foods to eat for hard gainers trying to pack in extra calories, specifically protein? I want to address the snack word because it's been a while on the podcast. I used to tell clients there's no such thing as snacks. There's only complete meals and incomplete meals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like one of the most common questions that we get about like and and the reason why I used to teach this to clients is because I just think it's a it's a bad habit to get into trying to figure out what's a good snack or a bad snack. It's better to look at every time you eat, it is a meal and is it complete or is it incomplete? Because it's very hard to hit all your macronutrient targets, regardless if you're trying to build or you're trying to lose and you're doing it through these snacks all day long. Mm -hmm. It's just way, it's much easier to look at the time you're about to eat and you're also far better off resisting eating some food for that, you know, to hold you over until that right. next meal, resisting eating that and having a bigger, fuller, uh, complete meal than to have all these little snacks. Not to mention uh, that category of food, usually yes. like, what are you going to get That's in right. that category? So yeah. like, well, let's just eliminate that category and focus on the meals and then, you know, the spillover of like, I didn't get enough protein. How am I going to do this? Maybe that's where uh, an opportunity lies in finding a snack that has more protein. I would. So if I had a client, well, what about like fruit, like an apple or something, right? Okay, well, that's fine. It's not bad. But if I, if you're going to eat, so let's say an apple on average is about 150 calories or so, unless it's like a giant one, you know, let's say about 150, 200 calories. I would much rather see 99.9% .9 of my clients not eat the apple and eat three more ounces of the chicken breast at dinner sure. mm -hmm. or two more ounces of the steak that they're about to eat because protein is much harder for them to get. And a lot of times they fill up on carbohydrates and that's part of the reason that doesn't allow them to hit their protein targets. I would much rather see my client resist the snack and then have a, a bigger, more complete yeah. meal. When, when your challenge is getting in enough calories and i know some people watching are like oh i hate those people but it, it, this can be a challenge for some people is getting in enough calories to get to their muscle building or weight gain goals that can actually be very difficult the things you want to look at are calorie density and uh, digestibility because those are the things that will get in your way like is this food something that i can easily eat and then is it okay and easy for me to digest because if you eat the wrong foods Either you waste your time eating a big meal because the calories are too low or you eat food that makes you feel bloated and then you're screwed for the next meal. Now, I have some staple bulking foods that I would eat that were just super effective for me at packing on size. The, the, the most uh, impactful food was literally I would get 20%, 80% lean, so 20% fat, ground beef, and I would have that with white rice. So I'd mix that with white rice and I would make the white rice with bone broth. And that would be a bowl that was 1,200 calories, 60 grams of protein. There was some good carbohydrates in there. It was very easy for me to digest. It was a very easy bulking meal for me, inexpensive. Ground beef is cheap. Uh, so is rice. 
So was bone broth. And then I throw in some vegetables on the side. But that was like a, for me, that was a staple uh, weight gain food and it, one of the easier ones that I, I well, put together. And I'm going to push back on the continuing to, and you're naming a complete meal. That's so right. I'm going to, I'm going to keep pushing back on the snack thing of like, if you're a hard gainer and you struggle getting calories, be careful and weary of filling it up with, you know, nuts and carbs and snacks in between your meals. Go get what you need through whole foods and whole meals yeah. first. And then if you were a client of mine, that's a hard gainer. I might allow you to enjoy what the dessert at the end of the night looks like. If you still need calories, we've hit most of our, our our macronutrient targets. You just need more calories, some fillers. And then I like then I would prefer to use something like Magic Spoon. Go have a giant bowl of Magic Spoon at the end of the night where you get 40 grams of protein and you're not overloaded full of sugar and it tastes amazing. So, you know, pile that onto the end of the night if you need more calories. But what you don't want to get caught up is, oh, I have a hard time. I'm a hard gainer. And then you start to have all these snacks. I tried this, yeah. by the way, too. I, I, cause, th and this is where I'm, I'm speaking from that. I'm speaking from being a hard gainer my whole life, trying to figure out the hacks to get the calories. And a mistake I made was thinking that this was a good hack. Like, oh, I'll start to carry. I'm sure you did this yeah. too. I'd carry peanuts in my pockets and I'd have in all between these, meals. Yeah. I'm just eating this. Yeah. We, I'd have a box of wheat thins I carry all the time. And I'd be, <laughs> I did all that bullshit. You know, and you actually, what you end up finding out is that you, if you even hit your calorie target, you fill it up full of crap and you don't hit the things that are most valuable, like lean protein. And so, and that was just to get to your calories, right? So instead, I would always coach my clients, and this is myself also, get all what I need, like through these whole meals and a great choice, you know, some ground beef and rice is just easily digested. Yep. You can you keep piling it on. Well, do people associate like protein shakes in this category of snack? Because I know there's a lot of eating a meal and then I did a workout, I get a shake yeah. and then I eat another meal and then I get a shake and then I go to bed and I get a shake. So, so my, my most valuable piece of advice when it comes to a hard gainer and how to use shakes in my experience, so this is my own personal experience um, that I found was I did like to do a shake right after my my workout because what I found was I could pound it really quick and then he in the car. By the time I got home, I was still hungry because I just had this intense workout. That shake had already digested it. It wasn't very much. I got my got my protein intake and then I'd sit down and eat a whole meal like that. I, I found so you could sneak in more calories that way yeah, if it's hard. That's, yeah, that's right. Here's the second yeah. value with protein shakes is at the end of the day when go. I look at all my calories and I go, oh man, I missed it by 50 grams of protein or buy 500 calories. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make myself a, a shake, throw some bananas and peanut butter in there, blend it up, and now I made up for the difference. But it definitely- Those is, are the two ways I use yes, shakes. Exactly. Yes. But the goal, by the way, is always to get it through whole foods. Like, yes. So my I set out every day with the intent to eat meals just like Sal just suggested, which I think is great, you know, or quinoa pasta and sweet potato yams. All those are great yeah. choices. And even if you're fine, if you don't, like gluten doesn't bother you, even regular pasta and potato, white potatoes, everybody demonizes oh, yeah, potatoes good. Yeah, but if you like that stuff, like eat that with your, your meats, hit your protein targets. If you're still struggling, then pile the shake on at the end of the night. Next question is from Ethan Nietzel. What are great exercises to improve your vertical jump? You know what's funny about this? Had you asked me this 10 years ago, my answer would be focused around building power and strength. Yeah. And that would be improve your vertical yeah. jump. Then I, I, I met all technique. Th yeah. Then I met PJ Performance by a great Instagram page, really, really smart guy. This is his expertise. And he would improve people's verticals by tremendous amounts. And most of it was technique of jumping, yeah. mm -hmm. the skill of jumping. Yep. And of course, this makes perfect sense. Jumping, running, throwing a ball, throwing a punch. There's a lot of skill and technique involved. And if you maximize the efficiency of your movement and maximize your technique, the dividends that'll pay you back are tremendous. So I would say that's the most important thing. Oh, then I, you can look at building strength. I and totally agree. Power. And I've had clients like this too. Where I feel a little bit guilty because I was approaching it with that same mentality. Oh, we need to do some some power cleans or we need to yeah. do some explosive type exercises with weight in order to get them to then have that effect where um, they're going to have this like recoil effect. They're going to jump higher, you know, by default. But if I would have known all these like very specific types of biomechanic techniques uh, to approach the jump to, uh, you know, get a better stride, uh, you, you know, lots of things that he teaches on there in terms of like, you know, even how to land and how to, you, you know, decelerate properly 
properly and uh, you know how to control your body better, how to have like the proper mobility so it allows uh, you know the full the full range of motion capacity that uh, you know your joints can go through. So you know that has a lot more value to me now than the strength training part of it. Well, I'm, I'm going to redeem you guys a little bit though here because I I was a kid who played basketball. And I never squatted as a young kid. Yeah. And later on in my early twenties, uh, I began to squat. I began more motivated to you know be a buff guy, right? And I was playing less and less basketball, and I began squatting for like the first time in my life. And I, you know, back then like two twenty five actually was a lot of weight to squat for me, and I'd worked up to that. And I remember I hadn't played basketball in a pretty extended period of time. And, you know, then I got out there with the buddies to do it and I could throw down and I could throw down like way I could, I could barely like once a season, I could, at the peak of the season when I have worked on my technique and I was lean, could get up there and kind of dunk it. Yeah. I drop step two hand dunked it and was like, it blew me away how much you know, training the squat actually did improve my vertical. Oh yeah, you keep the technique the same and you get stronger, of course. So yeah, yeah. Yes. so I just yeah. want- Getting stronger is a fact. Okay, yeah. so yeah. I just want to make that clear to yeah. someone who's listening right now, if you are- uh, That's a good point. If you're not doing any sort of strength training and you build the strength, the explosive power by, from like a squat, it, like for somebody, you will see that translate into your vertical. Now that being said, uh, if you are not following uh, Paul Fabritz, which is PJF Performance, if you're not following uh, Max Smarzo, which I believe that's un is it under his name? I think it is oh. Max Smarzo, mm -hmm. and also our buddy Corey uh, Corey which, Schlesinger. Corey Schlesinger, the three of them. Corey is the uh, sports performance coach for the Phoenix Suns, which are kicking ass right now, right? So if you're not paying attention to him, you're you're losing on this battle too. And then also, I think Paul yeah. is one of the the greatest strong thinkers. by sciences. Thank uh, you. Max and and Max and Paul are business partners. So those three guys, I think, are leading the way in uh, sp basketball specific sports performance. Although that translates into other sports. Mm -hmm. So if you are an athlete or you're interested in that, uh, those guys are a wealth of knowledge. I've learned a ton. Uh, from just following them. I remember I found Paul when he had like less than 10,000 followers. I remember showing Justin, look at this guy. This guy's got incredible content yeah. and he puts out Well, the fire. point, I guess, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up too, because I mean, we could like maps performance or like our, you know, even maps in a ball, like where we're just focusing on the entire body getting strong, having the foundational strength mm -hmm. uh, first. So I guess from my perspective, it was, I was training uh, people that would come to me that had already been, you know, building off of their strength, yeah. but now yeah. they're, they're really hyper-focused on, you know, improving this technique, uh, which is really what it is. It's it's the technique of it once you have, uh, you know, that base strength. So, yep. you know, we're, and we're always talking to the general audience of people out there. Right. So, uh, you know, our wheelhouse is definitely in that direction. And that's why we bring them up because they've taken the technique of it and fine tune it in a yeah. way that's like, you know, superior to what else I've seen out but, there. But that matters, yes. you know, because who we're talking to makes the world of a difference as far as like what advice is better or not. If you've been strength training for a very long time, and you just want to increase your vertical, then I would push you in the de direction of technique, right? For sure. But just getting stronger is going to carry over into vertical and yeah. speed. That's the first you, thing you need to you do. You throw a punch. You gave all these analogies yep. of sports. Listen, uh, I've never been a boxer, um, but I guarantee you uh, me hitting you today versus me punching you 15 years ago, you know, and, and I might have been, I was quicker, faster, which everyone knows speed is very important with punch, but I am much bigger and stronger and have more power behind me. You can anchor yourself. That's You're right. Grounded. And yeah. so similar, similar. It's, it's all important. Uh, but if you compare head to head techniques in any physical pursuit that is athletic technique is always, it tends to be king. But if you're just generally stronger, that works too. So how would you improve your vertical jump with strength? Squats, split stance squats, mm -hmm. single leg type squats. And then of course you can train your calves. You can do explosive plyometric type exercises. But I'm gonna tell you this right now, if you got bad technique, uh, it's it's going to make a difference, but not a huge difference. And to highlight that point that you're making is I remember when Paul was on the show, I think he brought this up on the show. If not, we talked about this off air that 
uh, he actually took, and I believe he was a, a, a collegiate level athlete and, and gained six inches. I mean, that's his, huge on his vertical. Like changing his insane. technique. In the, I wish I would have met him when I was in high school. Right, in the same day. So just to highlight. Yeah, you're not going to do that with strength. No, you can't. No, you're not. Your squats will not give you six uh, inches vertical. In a day. You, maybe not even over a year, probably. Sure. You know, it, not that. I mean, that's a lot. So. Technique does matter that much. Absolutely. Look, if you like our content, you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out our free giveaways. We give away stuff all the time. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. You just know right away when you're eating the right types of foods that are benefiting you. And, yep. and it's not just about flavor and just about calories. It's about like, you know, what quality of food you're putting into your body but then also like what kind of movements are you doing and, and if you feel strong and able-bodied like what kind of mood that puts you in it's huge yeah.